the lecture. Christian Tedeschi is visiting Cranbrook from Los Angeles, California, where he is Associate Professor in Sculpture at California State University, Northridge. Tedeschi's work is interdisciplinary in nature and utilizes a variety of materials. Fabricated and found objects, sounds, and smells are employed as a means to create a very body of sculpture and installation. Rooted in material and object slash spatial poetics, as well as deconstruction and recontextualization. He fabricates, alters, and reinterprets objects and situations to create psychoactive forms, narratives, and experiences. He is the co-founder of Object Orange in Detroit, Michigan, and has exhibited both nationally and internationally. Tedeschi is also an alumni of Cranbrook, and we are pleased to welcome him back to the campus. Please join me in welcoming Christian Tedeschi to the podium. Uh, thanks, Riley, and thanks, everyone, for coming, um, particularly like, you know, Cheeto and Dylan and Susan and Rebecca. And it's so great to see this convergence of people in one room. Um, <clears throat> and the sculpture department for having me out. It's really nice. Um, I, I didn't know how to really, I don't know about this, but um, how to deal with this lecture because it's such kind of a personal thing to come back here. And um, so I figured I would just kind of run the gamut. This is there's a lot of things missing, but um, you know, I kind of wanted to sort of go through my experience from graduate school to now and through the work, I guess. Um, so it's a little bit of a different type of lecture than I would normally <coughs> do, but, um, but I think it, it was kind of fun to look at some of these objects. And so I'm just gonna start, um, or interventions, objects, whatever. Um, this, was, um, uh, this was an old gallery that some people probably remember called Tangent Gallery. Um, it was in Detroit and there was a, sort of a fundraiser for this bicycle place in Detroit called Back Alley Bikes, and I'm not sure if it still exists, but they would teach uh, inner city children how to sort of construct bicycles, and then the kids would, would be able to use the bicycles. So there was this one, at the time, there was this one little block with all these kids riding bicycles around the block, and it was this really beautiful little scene, and they asked me to do uh, an installation, and um, and gave me, Paul, <laughs> and he gave me um, uh, access to all the bicycles and bike parts that they were going to throw away, and so um, this was uh, a piece that I made. And, um, and it was only up for a night. <clears throat> and um, it basically, I mean, these are, the, particularly the early sort of interventionist pieces are gonna have some pretty bad images, and I apologize for that, but you know, uh, Keep in mind, this was like 2001 or two. <laughs> um, and you know, this is uh, the, a picture of, it, of an incinerator. Um, I, think, I can't remember if this is the actual incinerator uh, in Detroit. I picked an image out. But just to illustrate the idea that uh, Detroit built an, an incinerator within the city limits. And um, uh, it was, it was designed to power all of the, it was supposed to power all of Detroit uh, in its initial inception, and, um, and it didn't, it failed, and so then we're, the Detroit community was just left with uh, the stink of it. Um, <clears throat> it powers some of the buildings now, some of the major institutions, I think, um, some, I believe, hospitals and maybe Wayne State, um, but that's about it, and um, because the smell was so bad, it would go over to Windsor, Windsor would complain, and the way that the sort of legislation, or the legislators in Detroit dealt with it was said, oh, we'll, we'll burn your trash too, how about that? So they brought more trash over. And so sometimes at night you would wake up to the smell of uh, maybe like dirty diapers or something like that, and um, it, was, it was really, uh, it would just made me mad sometimes. Um, so, I did this piece called, it was Operation Heal Detroit, and <clears throat> those were um, uh, uh, steam crystals for a steam shower. Um, they're aromatherapy crystals for a steam, steam shower. And so uh, there's all of these, a part of the byproduct of the incinerator is all of these, and I, again, this is, 
2001, two, somewhere around there. I have no idea um, what it's like now, but um, at the time, this was like the steam was just coming up in these random manholes, and it was really hot in some cases. And so I thought of this idea along the Cass Corridor to uh, go around with my buddy Brent Summerhauser, and we um, uh, covered these manholes with um, with aromatherapy crystals. So the whole street, if you were walking down, you would uh, you would get the scent of these things. And these uh, manhole covers were, you know, they kept people would keep people warm, keep homeless people uh, warm at night in some occasions. And uh, we handed them little bags of aromatherapy crystals uh, and showed them how to use it. Um, this was, uh, this is actually Cheeto. Um, and, the, you know, near, this is near the Wayne State campus. Um, so you can kind of get a sense. This is just a funny thing, but I do have that same scarf still with me. Um, and this was, um, uh, this is a labyrinth made out of, uh, tires from an illegal tire dump site. Um, basically, uh, in the, you know, this is, I mean, I should contextualize some of this work because I was making objects going up to this and I stu still continued to make objects when, while this was all happening. But, um, but you know, this was sort of after 9-11. I mean, if you look up my thesis here, it was kind of all about being in this really privileged generation that never experienced war or like too much hardship and what that what that kind of meant it was sort of seeing this the thinking about the state that I was in you know culturally and then literally a few months later 9-11 happened everything changed and the work got like deeper it, it's, I mean I started getting really kind of concerned with some some more sort of political uh, issues <clears throat> And so this, uh, so one of the things, like, because I, I always scavenged and went around the abandoned buildings, warehouses and houses and things like that, just looking for materials and looking for, I don't know, ideas. It was just fun to do. Um, it, this was filled with tires. And what would happen is the, the, the tire repair shops, instead of actually properly disposing of the tires or recycling or whatever they would do with the tires, they would just throw them into one of these abandoned homes or buildings, and um, and it's like free waste because it's very expensive to to you know get rid of all these tires. And I called in a friend of mine who's a landscape architect, and she planted um, all these sunflowers in in the tires to make a labyrinth. Uh, this was right across the street from a church, and so I, it was in the hopes that. <laughs> people might actually walk from the church into the labyrinth where <clears throat> traditionally that's where labyrinths kind of belong is in some proximity of a, of a church. And, and the idea is that you sort of, uh, if by walking the labyrinth there's no, um, it's not a maze, there's a difference between a maze and a labyrinth. A maze has false walls and confuses you. A labyrinth, labyrinth is a continuous loop that you follow but it twists and turns so much that you lose your, your sense of space and time and thus hopefully, in theory, finding yourself. Um, so there's this, some images, and then a few months later I came back and it was all, it was all ruined, you know, but that's sort of the nature of it and there's a sunflower left in the thing. So I'm gonna go a little bit quick because there's a lot of images. I mean, there's a lot of work and, um, it, at somewhere around that time, I got asked to, to be in the show in Milan, and it was this, it was called the Urban Edge Show. And, um, you know, it was because I sent some images out of, like, the, some of the things I was doing to some friends. And uh, in that show, <clears throat> this is the only image, actually, I have of the work I made for that show. Um, and I hated it. I hated the show. It was, uh, like, Shepard Ferry was in it, and, like, Blue and Banksy and B it was all of those kinds of people and it seemed like the work was um, really taking the city of Milan uh, for granted and and taking advantage of it in a way that I didn't really didn't like you know it was they were just tagging everything and the people that lived in Milan were pissed and it just seemed like it seemed really rude and obnoxious and kind of um, insensitive and also it 
there was this real machismo to the whole thing. And um, so these were the pieces I made. I didn't, everyone was making all this, like these big graffiti sort of things and they were going um, out at night and sort of, you know, blowing up the whole town with nothing. They were saying nothing. There was nothing important. They had the public's attention. They were, they were insisting on the public's attention, but they had nothing to say. They were all pseudonyms and uh, propaganda for their corporations or whatever the heck they they were doing. But I, I was turned off by the whole thing. It was sponsored by Xbox. <laughs> it was so it was such a weird thing. But I was inspired by the the show got shut down four days after it opened, and um, because of what they did to the town, it was very disrespectful. So the community did not want the show. And so um, when I came back to Detroit, I started thinking a lot about a public, uh, the power of a public sort of mark, uh, you know, what, what that sort of represents and, um, and how people actually pay attention when something is put in front of them in a public setting. So, it, you know, it, it was kind of fortuitous or something to come back to Detroit and just be like, oh yeah, there's some things, this is a, uh, this is an abandoned home. That's uh, my friend Mike Richardson, and um, uh, and, and basically the some of these homes, as you can see, I mean, if you look like down here, that wasn't a house that was being built. It was really dangerous, and some of them were in the neighborhood that we all lived. And I was in a warehouse at the time that where you know people were throwing bricks through the window, and you know you kind of wonder like what is the what happens you know like. Like why, why, you know, I'm nice to everyone in my neighborhood. Why are they throwing bricks through my, like I'd literally say, hey, how you doing? And walk in and then a brick would get thrown through the window. Um, but these were in the neighborhood. So if you believe in images and believe in art and the power of an image, then you, you know, I know that uh, uh, large corporations definitely do. That's why they have billboards, that's why, you know, uh, you see a McDonald's burger on a billboard and you want one. I mean, they do a lot of research in that. Well, these are the symbols of, you know, what? Uh, abandonment and neglect and, um, you know, and that's what, they're, that's what these kids were growing up with and, you know, and it seemed maybe it would be a good time to try something and so I talked to these guys here. This is Mike and that's Jacques Lee down there on the le bottom left. And, uh, and we decided to come up with this idea uh, of painting these houses orange and see, seeing what happens. Um, and it was just kind of like highlighting it. Um, we thought that the color orange was, was reminiscent of like a community service kind of idea. Um, and we, just, we kind of thought it was funny. Um, but we never really, I mean, we didn't take it that seriously. Like, we just we thought it was crazy and we're like, ah, that's hilarious. And then, you know, a week later, it was torn down. And it was like, ah. I mean, because those places are really dangerous and, um, you know, a lot of crazy things happen in those places. And so, <clears throat> so, we, um, so we thought that something happened. So we decided to kind of go nuts and, and start painting a lot of houses. So this was a neighborhood in Highland Park right off the freeway. And we tried to stick to, to the freeways so that people would see them. Um, and a good majority of them, I think all of them are down now. I don't, are, do you know, Paul? Are they down? Uh, yeah, <laughs> no idea. But uh, yeah, this was like a neighborhood. And, and this was featured on the, um, on the news when the Super Bowl came to Detroit. They, this was on the road sort of going to the Super Bowl, the Lodge Freeway. And so they really heavily sort of featured these things on, on the news. Um, and then we got interviewed on like a NPR and, um, and then they sort of cut that interview, like they did the interview and then they interviewed the mayor at the time. And the mayor was like, yeah, they're, well, if we catch them, they're going to jail, you know. Uh, each each ha house would be a one act of vandalism. And so, yeah, they're, you know, they're going to, they're contributing to the blight and they're going to jail. And so that sort of pushed us further to keep, <laughs> keep going, but it also scared the heck out of us. Um, and I think he was, he was mad that we were sort of pointing a finger at something or, you know, whatever it was. And uh, it turns out now he's in jail 
uh, Kwame Kilpatrick. And um, so, but I was, I got really paranoid and really weird because I had orange paint all over my car and all my, my clothes. And uh, the project was called Object Orange. And, um, you know, it, it, it turned into this kind of crazy, crazy thing, but, um, but it, you know, it, it felt like we were doing, like at the time it really felt like, it felt right, it felt like we were doing something good or, you know, but this was after like four years of living in Detroit. Um, I would feel very uncomfortable, this was inside one of the houses, <clears throat> um, I would feel very uncomfortable, and I should say this for, particularly for the students here, like just going into a place and manipulating the, you know, like I think you gotta spend time with a place in order to be able to respond, you know, if you're interested in the social practice type of work. Um, it's, uh, it's really insensitive. It's like the graffiti people that I was telling you about that, you know, just going in and thinking that you know how to manipulate something is just not, it's not respectful, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's, you never know, like the, some things go really deep, you know. Um, and so, yeah, they tore down all these houses. Um, and so it was kind of funny. I mean, I think that, um, I think they thought they were destroying art, you know, that they were destroying someone's artwork, but they were like completing it, you know. Um, and, and in that way, it was kind of beautiful. Um, but it was like, you know, the power of like a, one coat of paint, you know, it was kind of a fun, it was really, we all got really obsessed with this project and um, it was really, uh, it felt like something was like, when you push up against something and then it responds, I mean, we had no idea, then that propelled us to go further and to, and to push it in, in different ways. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna move on. Um, and if anyone has any questions, you can stop me, but I'm gonna try to, try to go fast, man, because uh, there's a lot of work, but this, um, and everything has a story, and I think that the big sort of overarching uh, um, thing here is that, I, I, I mean, I go through phases of work that I do make bodies of work, um, but I mostly, if I see something that is that sort of turns my head or something, I, I respond. Or if I get involved with something or something happens, uh, and I, I try to respond with, with the work. I mean, that's the only, I'm not a writer, I'm not, you know, uh, you know, I'm not good at expressing myself in a lot of ways, and sometimes I'm not good at even expressing myself in art, but the, uh, but I think it's like, you know, I, like you try to, exp like I look at people's work that's really focused, and I'm like, I'm so jealous of that, you know? I can't do it, but because like, I feel like a different person almost on, on a regular basis, you know? Like, I'll see something one day, hate it, love it the next day, so then how do I, gauge what's my critical sort of uh, uh, analysis, what's happening in my mind when it comes to my own work, you know? It's the same thing, it's like, I love it, hate it. So, I, so there's a lot of fits and starts, like I'll st I got something, I'm working on, I'm super into, and then I move to another thing, and then that goes and I hate it. I like, <laughs> it's like I, you know, I have, uh, uh, maybe I have attention deficit disorder or something, but I tend to move around a lot. So this was, I was asked to be a godfather uh, to my godson, and they make you a answer these questions, uh, the rites of baptism. Um, <clears throat> we can't really read them, but can you guys read that? Okay, uh, yeah, I really like the glamor of, do you reject the glamor of evil or Satan or something? Anyways, I had to stand in front of the congregation and talk and say yes, 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 and you know, I f pretty much felt uh, <laughs> I felt like I was just lying in church, which is really strange, you know, for someone who was brought up Catholic. Um, and I have a real a lot of the a lot of the work that you that you'll see has these sort of religious undertones or overtones at times. And um, you know, it's because of like dealing with some of that in my life and in in my past. And uh, you know, like I, I like. Uh, you know, when I was 17, I actually was exercised, you know, my, my parents had me exercised, and I had a priest that was a, a pedophile, and, um, you know, but it wasn't, you, you know, I'm, I'm okay, but, it, but my friends weren't, and uh, I was too dirty, uh, too dirty and sticky of a kid, <laughs> 
Um, but those, th I mean, when I think about sort of some of the, some of the uh, activities that I performed as an altar boy, you know, it started when, when that news came out, it really grated on me. It really, um, it was just gross. You know, you're wa you have to wash their hands. You have to give them wine. You have to, you know, whatever. Anyways, um, so uh, this, uh, <laughs> um, this, they, uh, uh, this guy who was here a while ago, Fabio Fernandez, was a good friend of mine, and um, he was running the thing called the Forum Gallery, which is, um, was like an alumni gallery here in the museum. And he asked us to do this, like it was called the Literary Print Exhibition. And um, it was for uh, any kind of, any form of literature. I based mine on the rites of baptism. And so I got into this whole thing. I wanted to do a, um, a lie detector test being asked the rites of baptism, a polygraph examination. And uh, I couldn't get anyone to do it. So finally, everyone was sort of freaking out on me, saying that I was sort of trying to undermine them as like a polygraph examiner, like a legit licensed polygraph examiner. And then I was like, well, I just saw on Montel Williams the other day, for those of you who don't know, he was a big talk show host, kind of like a shock talk show, whatever those shows, Jerry Springer type shows. And um, I just saw on Montel Williams that like, someone had a lie detector and saying like, do you love this person? And then they had him hooked up to a lie detector. Like, what do you call that? And she was like, oh, Michael Manning or whatever his name is. He, we don't consider him part of the, of the polygraph examiner or whatever. And I was like, I just want someone to do it. So I said, thank you. I wrote down his name, called him, and he literally flew out to, to interview me and ask me these questions. And he felt weird too. I mean, he was like, yeah, "That's a little creepy, man," you know. But um, but we finally did it, and um, and these were. This is one of the pages. It was kind of a long scroll, which I, I have now. But uh, I had the lim the limits of the exhibition was like a sixteen by twenty print. Um, some of the answers for those of you who are wondering, um, you know, I really tried to answer them to the best of my ability. Like try, like I closed my eyes the whole time and thought about the questions and really. <clears throat> you know, tried to answer them, and he said there was a couple of them that seemed questionable, that he would have to redo it again, and, you know, if, if it was like a legitimate um, examination, but, um, so this is one, uh, this is what the print wound up looking like, and you can see that the lung, so the, yeah, the blue one is the lungs breathing, the green one is the nerves, uh, what does that say, uh, the skin resistance, and then the heart, um, and so, that was, um, that's sort of one of the things, right? And so the, the, here to talk about the overtones. Um, this uh, was a piece that I made. I guess this is, you know, I lumped this in with those. This is actually a little bit after, but um, this was made uh, at a, a model. Uh, we found these model, these church models, and um, there's a, mag a really powerful magnet inside, and there's a steak knife dangling from the magnet. Um, <clears throat> you know, I didn't mean it to be mean. I just wanted it to raise questions. I, you know, I, I don't have really anything mean uh, per se uh, to say about like people's faith or anything. <laughs> uh, maybe some, but the uh, but this was, um, you know, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I saw. So in Detroit one day. I was driving and uh, I saw this, um, it was a pipe exploded, a uh, water main exploded onto this car and it froze over. Um, and so it was kind of beautiful. I photographed it and I was friends with this writer at the time, uh, Nick Susanis, and he ran The Detroiter. It was a blog um, about sort of arts and culture kind of blog in Detroit. And um, <clears throat> this was really funny because uh, I was making all these sort of drippy uh, sculptures that I'll show you in a minute. And he thought that I did this, you know, and I, I just said, greetings from Detroit. And I sent it to him just as a joke. And he's, he did a write up about this as like one of my sculptures. <laughs> and so <laughs> I didn't tell him one way or another. And then the next time I saw him after it was posted, I told him and he was like, oh my God, man, you know, but it was really funny. 
Uh, this is more of what I was kind of making. Um, this one's called Organ, and it um, is ceramic. It's a ceramic sculpture, and uh, with resin poured all over it, and it's glued to the um, to the uh, palette. Um, I, I started working with resins when I sort of had a, um, a falling out with ceramics in a way. I, I thought that I could get more out of resins than I could glaze and surface treatment, things like that. And I liked more the content of plastic and petroleum-based products better than the sort of the history of, of beautiful glaze. Um, and so, uh, you know, this was sort of the beginning of... Um, of a large sort of body of work, I got obsessed with kind of playing with gravity, playing with dripping, playing with really common sort of found objects. Uh, this is a ladder glued to a, um, or just resin to floorboards. This was, act, uh, this was in Revolution. Um, this is the side of Revolution Gallery, and there's my old truck. Uh, and the, he, uh, Paul used to have this billboard that would, um, he would ask people to, to make a billboard uh, every every month or maybe every couple months, but um, but this is the one I did, and I was thinking about like the shining, uh, in a way, and you know there was a lot like this was sort of connected to the polygraph examination, um, but it was this kind of Fer the gallery was located in Ferndale, and Ferndale is like sort of right in the middle of like downtown and uptown, you know. Um, I guess uptown's the wrong way to put it, but the, the sort of the suburbs. Um, <clears throat> and so I was thinking about what you have for a billboard, you have like a second, you know, if someone's going to drive by, it's like a split second. And so what do you want to, how are you going to get someone to look, someone to pay attention? And the, the shining image of the blood pouring out of the um, uh, elevator is always one of those images that just burned into my brain that I can never sort of forget and I love that image so much and so um, so I was playing off of that idea a little bit and I started spinning plastic these are washing machine agitators uh, sort of creating this frozen sort of motion this frozen moment you know um, where they the thing that was kind of interesting with these is that <clears throat> you I sort of refound the kind of uh, the, the idea of, you know, the Fibonacci sequence or the, the, um, the golden mean, the kind of, uh, all of the, the golden spiral, all those things I've started to, I was thinking about after these, I was spinning them on a potter's wheel and pouring plastic onto them. And I realized like, oh, they kind of look like plants, you know, and, and then I thought, oh, that's why everything spirals because the planet is spinning. I didn't know that. Um, and then I was wasting a lot of material, and so I caught all of this material, and they became separate uh, works in and of themselves. And then this was for um, the closing of Revolution Gallery. It was called Revolution, and it was I poured uh, plastic on a ceiling fan until the motor seized, and this was sort of the look. So the idea of this kind of lifespan of this one particular force or, or system um, it kind of casts the motion of that um, and form these really beautiful, really fine kind of structures. Um, this is a bench grinder. This gallery was closing in Los Angeles and uh, they allowed me to do this on site. Um, similar kind of thing, like except for with the spray in the, in the I've always wanted to do that and it was always kind of a difficult thing to ask people, uh, yeah, can I just spray? I mean, I sprayed actually uh, release, mold release on the floor and it came off and I was able to scrape the wall off. But, um, so it wasn't as bad as I thought, um, but it was kind of, it was kind of nice to, to see. Uh, and so I did the same thing with the bench grinder. I poured it on there until the motor seized and I liked that idea a lot. And then, you know, of course, you get, I got kind of, you know, it's like you get bored, like you, or it's just like, where am I, when am I just repeating myself, you know, like, wh like, at what point, you know, like, okay, this one can be done on site, awesome, that's a different thing, and then what do I do, just keep pouring plastic on things, it just seems stupid, I, I didn't really 
didn't want to anymore. Um, and so this happened when I was moving out to LA. I had a, um, a steak knife in my car that I had wrapped with saran wrap. And I, I, I was, it was just to protect it. And so I moved out, I got a job in Colorado after, after this at Colorado University. And this steak knife stayed in my car and I think it's one of those things that you, uh, sometimes when you're working with found objects, they can either like, you can either use those things or they can go in your studio and one is a completely different life than another one. But this was, um, this one went to my studio after a long time and this is uh, wrapped in five miles of saran wrap. And um, I mean, it's really subtle and it looks different in the projection, but yeah, it looks like the wrap is off. It's actually more elongated, like a, the proportions of a steak knife. Um, these are, uh, when I moved out to LA, these were these, these plastic bags, they were banning them. Uh, and so they, now they, charge you money for them and they were trying to just get rid of them and so I hoarded a bunch of them and I made this piece uh, uh, that was a um, uh, milk crate and I sort of pulled all the plastic bags through um, through all the all of the holes and so it turned into this kind of I don't know I like the, I like these uh, this idea of these kind of I don't know I sort of uh, there was some kind of I just wanted to use them because it just seemed like, oh, they're going to go away, you know, and I don't know. <laughs> um, these were, this project was uh, something that, <clears throat> I know I'm going fast, and I told myself I was going to go fast, but I'm trying to really go quick. Um, this, uh, shopping carts were all over the neighborhood in my uncle's place where I lived when I first moved to Los Angeles, and I, I, I decided to keep them and it was the same sort of thing where it's like I was annoyed that they were on the block and so I took them and manipulated them. This was, some of them were flattened and some of them and so and hung on the wall and then uh, some of them were sort of manipulated, heated and stretched. Um, so this one is three of them. So I took them to the junkyard and had them flattened. Um, there's another one. Then I did this large. So it's like you sort of take it to its its end point, you know. And a lot of times I was trying to find the image of, I, I put these all back in the parking lots of the stores that they were from. <laughs> so this one went into the Home Depot parking lot. Um, this is the 99 cent store, uh, so on. <laughs> um, these, uh, uh, this, these are made out of broom bristles, right? So when I, uh, I got to Long Beach, I kind of, long story short, got really screwed out of a job. Um, I was there for a year and then, um, and they, yeah. So it's a long story. Um, <clears throat> I found myself like homeless and, uh, but I was able to muster up a couple hundred dollars a month uh, on unemployment to, um, to work in a to share a studio with some friends, and so I start and I had all day, all night. So I kept I started building these, and um, these are broom bristles glued together. And I was mainly I consider these things sort of meditations or things that kind of saved my life, I would say. Um, and so there's a lot of different sort of iterations of them. I had a lot of time and. Um, uh, my friend gave me a lot of Adderall and I would make these things nonstop um, and yeah so they would take like about a year to, uh, to make and I would and then I started um, I started kind of coming out of my her like hermit shell and I mean they literally I mean everything that had happened to me the past 10 years or so was in all of these. I mean, every single thing that I could think of, uh, uh, I was thinking about nonstop as I was making these things. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, like love in these, I, I feel like. And I, there was no way that I could um, throw them away. And so and now I have these things to tend to, <laughs> these giant, like this one is about 
eight feet tall, maybe eight feet wide. It's really big. Um, and yeah, and so now it's really difficult to throw out. Um, okay, this, hold on one second. This was a, uh, this is a piece that I did. It's called Black Hole. Uh, it's, these are all connected to each other. Um, vacuum shop vacs have a suck valve and a port and a blow valve, and so they're each blowing into each other in a continuous circle. And they're taking so much power that they they, they mess with the lights um, in the gallery. Um, but the sound is really. Um, And this was, I had no money. I had a credit card and I was able to cobble together enough on the credit card to buy these things from Home Depot. I had the show and returned them. So that's your, uh, that's one of, one of your lessons for today is, um, <laughs> I don't know how uh, ethical that might be. Oh, geez, I left it on. Um, for some of you, but I had no problem doing that. I was totally like destitute, so, um, and I needed to do this show. Uh, so, let's see, oh, god damn, this is too much, man. Uh, I had a feeling this was gonna happen. These are vertical blinds with lights behind them. Um, there's all kinds of implications here, r religious and otherwise, uh, it really looks, when you're in the space, it looks like there's a window, um, but there, there is, is no window. It's, uh, there's sort of fluorescent lights hidden underneath, uh, and it's a bicycle wheel on top. Mm. I'm just gonna, sorry, that's microwaves filled with pins and a stack of speakers uh, um, amplifying the sound. This is a Superman costume stretched out about 13, tall, 13 feet tall and stiffened with resin. It's called suspended animation. Um, this is a bunch of socks stiffened with resin called between modernism and masturbation. Uh, this is Pops Packing uh, downtown. And I did a residency with my friend Michael Bison in 2012 where we sort of had free reign of this space and all of the goods contained within it. Um, so there's, I mean, I have, you know, we, we spent some time really uh, curating the space and arranging objects. You can see the clown mask in the mirror as well. I mean, so there was little things like that where it became kind of a house, kind of a creepy, um, I don't know, it was just, it was a really fun intervention and, it, and Pops was really generous to like give us this whole house. Uh, but we cleaned it, we cleaned out a lot of the stuff in the house and that's me and Michael um, building this wall on the side of it that I think is still there. Um, and those are the, the I was telling uh, Francis, one of, you, one of you guys about the, ain't the Cupid things on the top. Um, and there's the wall at the bottom right there on the side of the house. And it's all the garbage that we cleaned out of the place. And we used some of the doors that we found as form work for the molds and then we filled it. And so you can see that there, you can see the impressions of the doors in there too. This is called the spider and the fly. I think it's a church pew and a, and a 270 pound uh, granite stone. Use your imagination. Um, <laughs> my father uh, had a, a stroke, and um, <laughs> that's not really light. Um, but I started thinking a lot about the mind and the sort of the body in a different way. I started thinking about objects in this way, and um, <clears throat> so I wanted to make this work where it was two, sort of two of the same object existing in the same space. And so this was a, a pumpkin that I had that was sort of dying, you know, after Christmas, not unlike a bunch of the pumpkins you guys have out there. And um, I made a mold and then I put the, the remains of it into the mold and cast resin around it. Uh, this is the same with beer cans. So you get more, illustrate that a little bit more better. And I was thinking like, you know, I'm here, I'm here lecturing, <clears throat> I'm 
I know that I'm here, but I'm also very aware of like little movements that I'm making. So there's this other sort of voice inside me, this other kind of, um, you know, this other thing, this other kind of mind, this other, I don't know what it is, consciousness or whatever, but I was trying to really replicate that idea somehow. Um, this is space, uh, space, 2001 Space Odyssey. Um, this is the negative space of the record. So I poured resin on the record and pulled it off. And then you play, when you play it, it's playing the spaces in between. So this is a soccer ball. Um, this is kind of an exhibition with some of those objects. This gets into like the plexiglass work. That's a meat door. That's a door filled with prosciutto. Uh, my family, I'm 100% Italian, and so I started using meats a lot in my work. Every time I go home, we have these we have these meats and I always think about them as like, you know, I, for, I used to be a vegetarian and it's like I think about them as these weird little bodies and um, they are flesh, it's really strange. And so I kind of used the salami as like a clamping mechanism uh, to hold these glass panels together. Um, and so throughout the course of the exhibition, they sort of, oh, Dylan was in this show. This, uh, this is um, in LA too. This was the first kind of iteration of that idea. It's during the course, they kind of tighten up and they really hold the glass well and they juice, the, the kind of juice runs down the sides and sort of leaks on the floor and streaks down the glass and it's really beautiful and disgusting. And, um, and Rebecca, you were in the other show. This one, well, that, this one. <laughs> um, so back to like the plastic idea, like the idea of cap encapsulating objects in plastic, which I was technically doing. I started thinking about plastic in a different way. Um, I still use liquid plastic and urethanes and stuff like that, but I wanted to, this idea of like everyone experiencing things through a screen through uh, a sort of a plastic lens, um, I started finding objects and then encasing them in these, um, in these vi sort of vitrines that are sort of custom fit to these objects. And sometimes putting them in relation to other objects. So this is a stingray that I noticed has a very similar shape as a dustpan. And the, mainly because the, the dustpan is designed to go on the ground, and so is the stingray. And so, I, like, there are just these weird sort of s connections. And a lot of my work, the way it's sort of developed, is through play, is through uh, experimenting through materials, um, and and sort of playing around with with materials and objects and together. Uh, this is a fake uh, plant. This is a pitchfork. Um, see that. But this idea of like this distance from things, that like not being able to touch these things, not being able to uh, grab the object or, um, but th that's kind of the way I see these experiences of, of looking at the phone. It's like you have all this information but you can't touch anything and it's this removal. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so I am really interested in that kind of, that removal, that distance from objects and, um, so I'm, I'm st I still make these, um, these plexiglass vitrines. Um, and this I, embedding, I always like to call them embedded sort of objects or encased objects. And uh, this is a ceiling fan. Uh, a friend of mine was leaving town and he had this gigantic piece of foam and wanted to get rid of it. So that piece of foam stayed in my yard for a long time and I wound up carving it and embedding a ceiling fan into it. Um, that I was going to throw away, uh, it was broken, and um, and then there's ice skates and a glove, and that black nub coming out is the top of the ceiling fan. These, uh, this is kind of newer work as well, and this is uh, like Nerf type foam. I saw this um, thing with Thomas Edison where he built a house with a single pour of concrete, and so I wanted to try to to do that with foam. Uh, with forms. I like that idea that foam expands into spaces, um, almost like a multiverse kind of 
um, idea um, and the sort of bubbles expand and inhabit places. So I make these forms out of cardboard and fill them up with foam and then remove the cardboard. Oh, that's another one, sorry. Um, all right, so I'm almost done. Um, whoopsie. This is a quick video of a rock on a ceiling fan. Um, and let's see, this is a quick video of a, what is going on here, of a, I have this kind of obsession with brooms. Oh, geez, I did not do that. Um, brooms and fans. Um, and so this is just sort of how I, I mean, like, so the way I work is I put things together. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I live with them in my house for a long time. Um, I'll put, I put this thing on a ceiling fan and lived with it for you know, a very long time. And then I kind of, through the course of living with, a, with an idea, you, you see how it can resonate over time. And sometimes these are like 3D sketches, but sometimes they just, they don't need to be anything else. Sometimes they stay that, and, and, and that's good enough. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, this is the last thing. I actually made it through. I know I'm over. But uh, this, is, uh, this is a, I spent so much time in my car in, in uh, Los Angeles, I, got, I started going a little crazy. And so this is a video taken from the left front uh, driver's side tire in my, uh, in my car, because I figured if I could get something done while I was driving, I wouldn't feel so miserable about spending time on the road. Um, so I started, this is an ongoing project, but this is in, uh, I took it to Las Vegas and drove around there for a while, so. Um, but this, so Mike, you can kind of, well, actually maybe leave it on for a second, the sound, and then, um, and then we can start to turn it down, but. Um, So it's a spy camera. Um, oh, and there's these girls walking by that have bags on their heads. I couldn't believe it, so I made sure I tried to like get them in the video. Um, it might have been like a bachelorette party. Oh yeah, I turned it to them. Yeah, see, I could not believe that. Um, and so I drove around Vegas for like an hour with this with this thing on. And I, you know, I would do it on the way to work and stuff like that, and, <clears throat> and I got these pretty interesting results from from this project. But so I, I, I guess that I'll just leave this playing, um, and I can answer any questions. I know it was a little scattered, and I was trying to get through a lot. But um, thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> Thank uh you. -huh.